so glad to be here this morning. I'm sure that you are as well. We're here to worship God and glorify His name. Remember the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, who made the fellowship and the blessings that we enjoy in this fellowship possible. Those of us who knew that uh, Judy Porter and her family might be here this morning were filled with anticipation at the prospect of seeing her again in particular and the rest of the family as well. But as it turns out, they were not here. They could not make it probably due to Judy's uh, condition. She probably wasn't feeling well this morning, but we look forward to seeing them again, hopefully, in the near future. This worship has been good so far this morning. The reading of scripture by Brother Robert, he always does that quite well. The spirited song service that John has been leading us in. The comments of that as he presided over the taking of the Lord's Supper. And at this time, we'll turn our attention to the the inspired scriptures, the Word of God, and hope to learn a lesson that will benefit us, inspire us, encourage and edify us to live faithfully throughout this coming week. The outline for today's sermon is in the news and notes. So if you picked up a copy of the bulletin this morning, you'll be able to follow along and you'll have a, uh, an outline of the lesson there that you'll be able to follow along with me as, as I preach. We began last week a series of lessons, and I'd like to remind you, it might be well, to think of these lessons not as a long series of lessons that can sometimes become boring and a little trite, but just think of these as individual lessons on very important topics that happen to all have been problems with the church in Corinth that we read about from 1st to 2nd Corinthians. Because each of these lessons are independent of the others in terms of the problems, the difficulties that the church there faced that they brought upon themselves, and they stand alone in that respect. But let me point out by way of introduction that Paul experienced opposition everywhere he went. The most unfortunate opposition was the opposition that he observed in the life of other Christians toward the Word of God, toward teaching and continuing to obey the teachings of Christ. And that was the situation here in Corinth. The church in Corinth had neglected to obey that which they apparently had already been taught, at least in many cases. So Paul is reaching out to them to teach them. The focus of First and Second Corinthians is to uh, correct those problems that they had. They were contentious. They had a reputation of being contentious. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11, Paul writes, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So he goes from that point on and illuminates our ideas on those contentions and offers ways to solve those problems that they were experiencing. And I also want to point out by way of introduction that Paul's corrections in reference to their problems was not so much focused on the initial problems themselves or the initial issue that confronted the church, but rather on the inappropriate manner in which they responded to the problems. For example, there were an immoral brother. That's mentioned, but not elaborated on. What is elaborated on is their arrogance at the sin rather than their mourning over that sin. And they refused to withdraw themselves from that wicked brother who is living in the world. In reference to the problem of suing their brother in court, there were personal issues that apparently come up among them that uh, one brother defended another. He doesn't concentrate, doesn't even tell us what those issues were. What he concentrates on is how they dealt with those issues. They took one another to court, they sued one another in civil courts rather than solving those problems within the church. And when there was a difference of opinion in what matters of liberty, he tells us how to solve that problem as well. And he goes on to some detail about how they were incorrect in solving those problems of dealing with liberty. He does mention the problem itself was that of eating meats that didn't sacrifice to idols, but again his emphasis was on 
how to deal with that problem and uh, make sure you deal with it in the correct way. So what we're going to do today is continue a discussion of the problems that the church there in Corinth was having. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, where he deals with those problems of contentions. The contentious brothers in the church. There was bickering and strife. Bickering and strife that had become so great that the members were taking one another to court over selfish, personal offenses. We don't know exactly, again, what those offenses were. But the problem was they were dealing with those offenses in the wrong way. They were taking one another to civil court. This is another example of how the church can establish a bad reputation within the community in which it exists. We notice that in reference to the sin of immorality. Later on in chapter 6 that we just discussed last week, that a brother who is living in a sin that was not even named among the Gentiles, the community knowing about that would certainly uh, think very lowly of those Christians there. They're not living up to their creed. They're not living up to the teachings of Christ. They're not practicing what they preach. And that would have a bad influence on that church and the community probably for generations. Who knows? Well, this is another area. Uh, these contentions that they were taking to civil court that would also establish a bad reputation for the church in the eyes of the community. At the root of these contentions, and at the root of how they settled these contentions, that are referred to here in chapter 6, really carnality was at the root of it. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 3 of 1 Corinthians says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, but until now you were not able to receive it, for even now you are still not able for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? So he can apply that attitude of carnality to a lot of their problems, such as we read about earlier where they were boasting of men above, above other men, and uh, where they were <coughs> emphasizing uh, human wisdom above the wisdom of God. And we're dividing the church up into classes of distinction, one being more distinct than the other, more important than the other. And even this problem with contentions where they took one another to court, that all goes back to their attitude of carnality. So carnality really was probably the root, or at the root, of all the problems that the church in Corinth suffered. But now we're talking about one uh, expression of that carnality, and there it is, they were taking one another to court. And as I said, it was going to have a bad influence upon the, the church there. I think we have an example of this <clears throat> over in the book of Acts, chapter 18. While Paul, in fact, was in the city of Corinth, an issue came up among the Jews against Paul and his preaching. And it says there in chapter 18, in verse 12, that Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. And then they complained about Paul, they made their accusations to Gallio, and he dismissed their situation. He says in verse 15, uh, If it is a question of words and names of your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Well, there was a discussion not between one Christian and another, but between Jews and the Apostle Paul. But it was a division among Jews, as he saw it, as Gallio saw it. And what reputation do you think that had upon the uh, civil authorities there, Gallio and other Roman officials, who saw this division among uh, the Jewish people? That, that would give them a bad reputation in the eyes of the civil authorities there. And the same principle applies to the church. Here in Corinth, where they had issues among themselves, probably one brother had been offended in some way. Maybe somebody stole something from him. Maybe there was property involved. We don't really know exactly what the issue was. But in a very selfish way, in a very short-sighted way, they were taking one another to court. And we, these contentions arose. First Corinthians chapter 6, 
verse 2 and 3 says, and this is an interesting aspect to this problem. He says, do you not know that the saints would judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So Paul points out there that what you're doing with one another is totally incongruous with how you should be acting as Christians. Because as Christians, in some way or another, we're going to be judging the unrighteous world. We're going to be judging the world. So in what way can you justify taking your problems within the church to the world for them to make judgment over those matters? You're going to be judging the world in the same way, uh, maybe, I don't know how, but maybe by contracts. Remember back in Matthew chapter 12, when Jesus was preaching at the unrepentant people of this towns there in Galilee, he said that the men of Nineveh, Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation. He also says that the Queen of the South will rise up in judgment against this generation. So that comparison was one way that people who follow God would be judges over the world, the unrighteous world, the ungodly world, the world that cared nothing for God's word. So maybe just in comparison, we are going to be judges of the world. I don't know. Maybe that's it. But whatever manner in which we're going to be judging the unrighteous people of the world, we should not be taking our problems to the world and asking civil courts to make judgments for our personal problems within the Lord's church. The contentious attitude of the people there, where one was so offended by an offense that he would want to take his brother to court, that was a problem within itself. And we shouldn't be so selfish or short-sighted that we would not be willing to forgive and even to suffer wrong. Paul said that in this very context. He said it's better if you suffer wrong rather than take your personal issues within the church to the civil courts. And uh, taking our problems before the civil courts is a shame for Christians. In verse 5, Paul points that out. He says this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between brethren? That's the solution that Paul gives. He says, it's either find a brother within the congregation, even the least esteemed brother. And I think you probably said that tongue in cheek or maybe sarcastically. I take the person that's least esteemed, or it may very well be that the person with the most spiritual information, the most spiritual knowledge, the most godly attitude, may have been the least esteemed among them. And in that case, he would have been more qualified to solve these issues between two other brothers who are at one another's throats. And if that doesn't work, he said, go ahead and allow yourself to be wronged. Take the wrong for be offended without making a big deal out of it. That's the example we have in Christ, the Apostle Paul, and other New Testament Christians that suffered for Christ's sake. They didn't spend their time blaming their issues on somebody else or their problems on someone else. They simply suffered wrong. We're not to suffer as an evildoer, but in suffering for Christ, we're following the example of Christ. And so that is certainly a worthy way to solve contentions that rise up among the church. If there's an issue here where a brother is offended in some way that cost him some type of personal uh, money or property or whatever the case might be, let's not even think about taking that matter to a, a court. That's unthinkable. That should not happen. It's shameful, in fact, as Paul says here in verse 5. Let's appoint a wise person, an elder, preferably, to mediate that problem between two brothers or two sisters, whatever the case might be. Either that or just accept the wrong and don't worry about it. And don't hold a grudge. So there was a problem there of contentions within the church there that Paul deals with in that fashion. You know, we live in a very litigious society, as it's often been said, but that, that litigious nature should certainly not influence or have a part in the Lord's church. Simply wrong if that's our attitude. Persons should not constantly be demanding their rights within the body of Christ. We should be wrong rather 
than make a shameful spectacle out of the Lord's church. Let's move on then to the next issue that plagued the church there in Corinth, which is brought out in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the entire chapter, verses 1 through 4. This chapter contains an awful lot of very detailed material that you can spend an entire series of lessons discussing. We're not going to get into that type of detail here, but we're just going to point out some of the basic points that Paul makes here. The society of the Corinthians, the town in which this church was located, was permeated with sexual promiscuity. So it's only natural that those particular sins, as they do in every culture, would to some extent or another affect the church as it did there in Corinth. They had these problems in Corinth, and we had them today. The only solution for marriage problems is the Word of God. And what God teaches about marriage, what God teaches about the attitude that husband and wife should have toward one another, the attitude we should have when we choose a mate, and even before that when we choose someone today. A Christian who is wise will not choose to become involved in a relationship, even if it's called dating, quote unquote, with someone who's not a Christian, because dating leads to engagement, engagement leads to marriage, and marriage to an unfaithful person who cares nothing about the Lord leads to divorce in many cases, or at least to a miserable marriage to some extent or another. So there are marriage problems that existed there in Corinth, which Paul highlights for us and teaches us some lessons that can be applied in our marriages as well. And ultimately, whatever the problem or situation might be, God's Word and the principles entailed there will solve the problem, hopefully before it arises. But he says there in chapters one, chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, he says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. God's order in marriage is monogamy, as he points out here. A man should have his own wife, and a wife should have her own husband. Not two wives, not two husbands, or not a, a group of husbands. He says that marriage is between one man and one woman, and that's taught in other passages as well going all the way back to Genesis. He says it's good, or at least all right, for a person not to marry. But for those who have normal physical appetites, who have difficulty controlling those appetites, it is best for those people to marry. It is best for them to marry. But it's good, he says, if you remain single, like Paul was. And he points out within the context that there were persecutions going on at the time, and because of that present distress, as he calls it, it was better for people to remain single. That way you would not be burdened with the spouse and with the children, with the family, when it came to dealing with the persecution against you. You'd be a lot more free to get up and move and to go from one city to the next, as Christians did, according to Acts chapter 8. At that time, and those who were married, of course, it would be an additional burden upon them. But if you're going to be married, you have to recognize and respect the monogamous nature of marriage as God intended, and as His Word still implies and teaches for Christians yet today. So there was a major problem with many people today, as there always has been, in entering into marriage. The entry into marriage with divorce as an ultimate option. They really have no ambition to make the marriage work. They don't think about the problems they're going to have and the difficult issues that they'll face in their marriage. They seem to have in the back of their mind, and they've been taught this by the world, by the environment in which they live, that divorce is a viable alternative. If things don't work out, if it doesn't turn out to be exactly like I thought it would be, if my expectations are not met, if I'm just not happy, divorce can be the ultimate way to solve those problems, and the Bible does not teach that. We remain married unto death, unto death do us apart. Matthew chapter 19 teaches that, and we have the example of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden again, to turn back to, to learn what God's uh, teachings are, what His expectations are 
in reference to marriage among the human family. So that's a major problem that brings the wrong solution to marriage difficulties. That divorce should not be seen as a viable alternative to marriage problems. If that's the case, then that uh, the odds are stacked against that particular marriage from the very beginning. He also points out within the context of verses 3 through 5 that marriage consists of mutual and reciprocal relationship with one another. Verses 3 beginning says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So here you have teaching in reference to the fulfillment of sexual desire, which God intended to be fulfilled within marriage. And he points out here that the marriage partners, a husband and wife, owe to their partner their sexual fulfillment. And it's not to be found in other things. You know, the most prolific way that sexual satisfaction is fulfilled today, particularly among men, but also I hear among women, is through pornography. Married men are satisfying their sexual needs with pornography. They don't need their wife anymore. And I've even heard statistics and reports about young people in college age and so forth who shouldn't be having sex anyway. They're not having sex as much anymore. Their sexual desires are being fulfilled again through pornography. And that habit, if it's established, can become an addiction, and that addiction will hamper your marriage. A man will not desire his wife if he can turn to all the beautiful women in the universe on his cell phone or on his computer and be satisfied sexually right there. That happens prolifically, ubiquitously in our society. And it's a sin. You've probably heard as well as I have in times past where Christian women have sought to divorce their husbands because of what they call mental adultery. And I'm not really sure if there's any legitimacy to that from the scriptural standpoint, but I can certainly see the problem. If a woman knows her husband is being sexually satisfied by viewing women on the internet or on a cell phone, and that's a habit with him, and she knows of that, where does that, where does that put her? What type of light did she see herself from her husband's eyes? She's useless in that respect, in that aspect of their marriage, and it, it, it demeans her. And it should not be a situation that exists. So I think the monogamous nature of marriage applies not only to having adultery, committing adultery with other physical beings, men or women, but also pornography. It's a fulfillment of that sexual desire that's supposed to be within the context of marriage with one's spouse. He also goes on to talk about the fact that uh, <coughs> mixed marriages. He talks a great deal about mixed marriages in verses 10 through 16 of this chapter. And he's talking about marriages between a believer and an unbeliever. And problems are going to rise up to one extent or another between a Christian who's married to a non-Christian. At least they should. If they don't, then it probably means that the Christian has probably compromised his or her faith to the extent that they're not trying to live as a Christian or trying to convert their husband or wife, whatever the case might be. So there will no doubt be problems. <coughs> problems will arise in a marriage between a believer and an unbeliever when it comes to whether she's going to be faithful or worship the center, attendance, and supporting the church in other areas as well that might be more physical in nature when he wants to enjoy Recreation on weekends, she wants to go to worship service, or maybe he wants to go and she wants to enjoy some type of recreation. And when the children are brought up, how are they going to be influenced? More by the unbeliever or by the believer? And he deals with issues that uh, go back to these mixed, the problems that come up with mixed uh, marriages. A believer is encouraged in these mixed marriages 
where a Christian is married to a non-Christian, to keep the marriage together, if at all possible, with the goal of winning the unbelieving spouse to the Lord. Verses 10 through 16 of chapter 7 uh, brings these points out. And I'm not going to take the time to read that. I hope you'll take the time to read that on your own. But it talks about the fact that if there is a mixed marriage and there's problems, it's a Christian's duty to keep the marriage uh, solid. To make sure that the marriage remains uh, intact and should not seek a divorce just because someone is an unbeliever or because of problems that might come up uh, in a, a mixed marriage such as this. And if a person can convert their spouse, if they remain faithful to the Lord, if they're consistent in practicing what they preach, and if they are consistent in teaching the Word of God, not just by word, but by example. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 1 addresses that specific issue. Where here Peter writes, Wives being submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the Word, talk about the same situation that Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians 7, that even if some do not obey the Word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So that's how a Christian handles the problems that come up within a mixed marriage, where a Christian is married to a non Christian. You be faithful, you be consistent, you be chaste, you be pure, practice what you preach, show the type of love toward your husband or your, your wife, and you are fulfilling your duty toward them in a scriptural, consistent manner. And by your example, you might bring them to the Lord as well as keeping the marriage together. So those are wonderful uh, admonitions that we receive within this context. And then Paul talks about the problem of whether to marry or not in verses 17 through 39 or 1 Corinthians 7. We've already pointed out that they were in the midst of persecution. Verses 26 through 31 points out and Paul was saying that remaining single might be the best option under that what he described as a present distress. Remaining single might be the best option. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2 tells us that marriage is honorable in all things. But sometimes it's better to remain single. And single life has its advantages. There's nothing uh, subservient or uh, less in honor to remain single than to be married. Marriage is honorable, but so is living a single life as long as that life is pure. There are some advantages to being single, just like there are some advantages to being married. And he says, if you remain single by your choice or by circumstances, make the most of it. Enjoy being single. Give God the praise and the glory and the honor for the advantages and the blessings that being single provide in your life. And if you're married, I have the same attitude. But we continue on with yet another problem that the church in Corinth was suffering from that plagued them. And all these problems come down to us uh, in uh, their famous notoriety. And that is the problem of Christian liberty. The problem of Christian liberty. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 13 deals with this. He calls them matters of conscience. But also chapter 10, verses 14 through 33, deals really in more detail with the same type of issue. We want to point out, first of all, that everything in the world is not black and white. Some Christians believe that once you become a child of God, or some sinner believes, once they become a child of God, that all of a sudden everything is simple. Every evil is obvious, and every righteous thing is obvious. And I think most of the time that's true. But I think there are also, as Paul points out here in this example, that there are situations that are, could be considered gray areas. And this is one of them. Uh, these present difficulties uh, that the Christians face there in Corinth are faced by us sometimes today. And here in Corinth, the difficulty was surrounding the eating of meats that had been sacrificed to idols. Sometimes that was okay. 
And sometimes it was not okay. And that's why we identify this as a gray area. Because eating and mix was not always wrong. The eating and mix was not always right. It was dependent upon offending someone who had a conscience against eating meat <clears throat> that had been sacrificed to idols. The Gentile converts who were brought to Christ by the preaching of Paul there in the city of Corinth, uh, they, they ate these meats that had been sacrificed to idols as an act of obedience, as an act of worship to their pagan gods. So to them, eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols, they could only associate with, associate with paganism. And it, pure and simple to them, it was sinful, it was evil. And they were not going to protect of these meats that had been sacrificed to idols under any circumstances. But Paul comes along within this context, and again, I'm not going to read the context again. You can read that on your own, and I bid you to do that. But he had a greater understanding, and other Christians did too, about the eating of meats. He knew based upon uh, Mark chapter 7 and verse 19 and 1 Timothy 4 and verse 4, that all things that God created for food were given for that purpose. As long as we accept them and receive them with thanksgiving to God, we can eat virtually anything. Thing that God has prepared or given to us uh, for uh, in the area of, of what we consider uh, edible uh, animals or plants or fish, whatever the case might be. So he had a more complete knowledge of these things. But there in Corinth, in reference to those Gentile Christians, that they converted away from uh, paganism, he says you have to be careful with them. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Got a frog in my throat, pretty big one this morning. Because there were Christians there that were offended when you ate meat in front of them. Because the context indicates that you make them sin. And Paul's not talking about just doing something that they didn't like. The idea of offense doesn't mean just doing something that somebody else doesn't like. And in that way they're offended. No, he meant doing something which causes them to sin. If you eat meat in front of these people who are weak in their understanding, and then they're led to eat meat against their own conscience, they sin. We can't do anything that's against our conscience. That's if we don't, if we anything that we do, we have to conscientiously believe it's, it's right. That's it's pleasing to God. But there is a possibility of, of uh, coming in conflict with our conscience. That's what Paul's talking about here. So if you are getting ready to eat a, meat, a meal of meat and then sacrifice the idols that you went to the grocery store to buy and you prepared it, and maybe you had a group of Christians in your home, if all those Christians believed it was okay to eat that meat, then there was no problem, there was no sin. But if there was one or two there who maybe had this pagan background who thought it was sinful to eat that meat, and you led them to eat it under pressure from the other Christians there. Well, they're eating meat. I guess we better eat it too. If they went against their own conscience in that context, they would be sinning. And the guilt would not be only upon them for violating their conscience. It would be upon the other people who forced them to violate their conscience, put pressure on them to violate their conscience. And Paul says that's sin. That's selfish. That's self sin. Just because you have more knowledge, that knowledge needs to be tempered with love. But but very point that he's made, he makes here in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. Be, but consult, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we, we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So we, we must temper our liberties, our Christian liberties, with love. Love edifies, but knowledge can puff up or cause us to be arrogant to the point where we overlook the offense that it might cause to another brother whose conscience tells him that it's wrong. And if we put pressure on that person to do that, then we can sin as well. Now over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talks more about these issues. In verse 25 he says simply, <clears throat> where he makes a more direct application uh, of his name of this subject, he says, if your conscience is not defiled, you do as you wish. Go ahead and eat, as verse 25 said. And this would apply to other things as well, not just to eating of meat, but to any so-called gray area 
When you have a Christian liberty to do something, but doing so is going to offend or cause another brother to stumble. We should do away with that. He also says in verse 26, 1 Corinthians 10, or if you eat this meat with other people who agree that it's okay, who have that knowledge, then that's fine. But if one is offended, verse 27 says in 1 Corinthians 10, you must refrain from engaging in that activity. There's a lot of judgmental matters that arise among Christians yet today. We have to be careful about that we're not offending other people with what we're causing them to sin. There's great areas, you know, such as the type of amusement that we uh, enjoy or take our family to. Some people object to some types of entertainment. Uh, my wife and my children have always been into the Harry Potter movies. We don't think there's any wrong thing with that. But when I drag someone who disagreed and, and I put pressure on them to go to a Harry Potter movie, just uh, uh, to the extent where it offended their conscience and they sin, no, that would be wrong. Uh, and there's other things like that, such as a person's work. Some people might say, might think some type of work is questionable. Other people may not. And so we have to be careful about those things and consider the conscience of other Christians. And our own influence when it comes to doing certain things that might be considered Christian liberties, but it might have a, a, a negative, sinful effect upon the congregation, upon other Christians. Well, that's the lesson for this morning. We will take a look at some other issues that plague the church in Corinth uh, next week as we continue this study. But again, look upon these lessons not as a one long, continuous series. It gets kind of boring, as I said, kind of trite as you go along. But all of these issues, these problems that plagued the church in Corinth, you know, Paul did say in our first Corinthians chapter 1, as he was introducing this letter in dealing with these problems, he said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, he writes these things to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all, who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So he's implying that I believe that the problems that he addresses here in Corinth are characteristic of every church, to one extent or another. The church is in the first century, as well as the church is now in the 21st century. These were not unique problems to the church in Corinth. They're problems that churches continue to share and deal with uh, in every place, in every time throughout history. So pick up your hymn books at this time and turn to the number that John has selected as a song of encouragement. Do we have any among our number this morning, Christian or non, who need to respond to the gospel's invitation? To come forward, to repent of your sins, to confess the name of Christ, to be baptized into him. We encourage you to do that. If we have any Christian who is still <coughs> in some way Maybe he has offended a brother in some sinful fashion. If for any reason you need to come before the church and before God to ask for our prayers to overcome whatever you're struggling with, we'll be glad to do that at this time. So if they do come, even now, it's together we stand and have to sing.